Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, Google Cambridge. We're very pleased to have today Susan Maycock and Charles Sullivan of the Cambridge Historical Commission with us. They'll be talking about their book, Building Old Cambridge. Old Cambridge is the area around Harvard Square, and it's especially interesting for a bunch of reasons. One of them is, of course, Harvard and all the activity that goes with Harvard, and some of the special buildings there. Now, we all know about the Georgian and the Victorian and the Neo-Georgian buildings at Harvard, but all, Harvard also has uh, the only Le Corbusier building in North America. It has two buildings by the great architect H.H. H. Richardson and so on. So interesting area. Uh, but beyond that, there are other interesting things in the Harvard Square area. Brattle Street, uh, an old street, uh, has been rich for a long time, uh, from before the Revolution. It was known as Tory Row, so there are many Tories on Brattle Street. I, I'm always curious to know what happened to them after the Revolution. Why were they there in the first place? Why were they in Cambridge rather than in Boston? Uh, things like this. Uh, so the architectural history and the history of the region of the area tells us a lot about the social, economic, and political history of the area as well. And I believe uh, Charlie is also going to be talking today about some of the development of Kendall Square, which when I first knew it many years ago was a bombed out flat area uh, and is no longer. Uh, so I think this will be a really interesting talk. So Susan, I think, will be introducing. Uh, and then Charlie. Oh, by the way. Uh, this is a book I got, I think, 40 years ago uh, about Old Cambridge. And now, with the additional research that's been done, we see that they've made it a lot thicker. So uh, <laughs> a lot of research has been done, a lot of interesting background, and I look forward to it. Actually, we started out thinking we would just kind of update that red one that's been out of print for years and years and years and should come back in because it's a really interesting area. And once we started looking at it, once we started working on it and realized how much more we had learned since 1972 when that was published, um, it just sort of wrote itself and ended up with 1,100 photographs and maps and what you get is a, a hefty volume. So I thought that I would talk to you a little bit about what the, who the Historical Commission is and what it does and then Charlie's going to introduce the book and talk some about Kendall Square as well. So the Cambridge Historical Commission is actually part of the city government. It's a, a department that deals with historic preservation. And with that, it um, works to preserve buildings and sometimes whole neighborhoods. And it also helps people understand the context of their buildings. And, oh, are you not? Can you hear me? Yep. The context of their buildings and how Cambridge came to look the way it looks today. So um, the commission protects over 3,000 buildings in Cambridge, but we have a file, an informational file, on every single building, all 13,000 of them. And this includes information on the history, maybe on the architect, the builder, who, who um, built it in the first place, who it was built for, and we then have thousands of photographs of individual buildings, but also of areas and um, maps and city directories. So all of this is open to the public. And we have researchers come in and we help them with whatever, if you wanted to know. If all of these people who live in Cambridge want to know about their building or their house, um, give us a call or come in and we'll walk you through it um, individually and see what we can find and sometimes it's great. We have newspaper articles from the time the buildings were built, et cetera. Uh, main part of the commission's mission has always been outreach, which we do through helping researchers. We also make house calls. We go out, we talk to, um, to help people with their um, technical issues. Uh, we also consult on paint colors to make them appropriate for the exterior of their house, depending on the history and the style of their house, um, which is uh, mandatory in the historic district, but is just um, 
informational in any other part of Cambridge, but it's made a huge difference over, we started doing it in the, during the bicentennial, and over that time, Cambridge has gone from being gray, gray and white, yellow and white, and white, to many of the colors that you see today. The, and we also publish books on the various neighborhoods and buildings of Cambridge. And this is our newest one, uh, Building Old Cambridge. And it's also our biggest one, as you can see, and our most well illustrated. But <clears throat> the title, Building Old Cambridge, sometimes needs a little explanation because some people think it's building ye olde Cambridge or old Cambridge buildings, uh, buildings that are old, but it actually, as Stavros said, is, um, it's centered on the um, area around Harvard Square that was the original settlement in 1630. So it became known as Old Cambridge to differentiate it from the newer areas such as Cambridge Port and East Cambridge that were developed in the 1800s. And so Old Cambridge as a name shows up on the map on the cover of the book and it shows up on some early maps. But the, these other areas didn't develop until almost 200 years after Cambridge was, uh, old Cambridge was established and developing. So Charles will give you the history of that, but now you know where you are. Okay, thanks Susan. What people have been telling you is true, that Cambridge um, was founded in 1630, um, several miles up the Charles River from, um, from Boston Harbor. It was intended to be the capital of Massachusetts. It was the only uh, town la uh, laid out on a grid plan um, in New England um, until New Haven was founded a few years later. It has the intersecting streets of Kennedy, uh, Dunster, Holyoke, Mass Ave, Mount Auburn Street, Winthrop Street, South Street are the original grid plan of 1630. The um, uh, legislature uh, in 1634 decided that Boston was a better choice. Um, and moved the capital to Boston, and in 1636, they gave Cambridge uh, Harvard University, or Harvard College as it was at the time, uh, favoring um, uh, Newtown, as the village was then called, over Salem, which was the other town in competition for the first uh, college in the, in the colonies, uh, or in the Northeast. So this, this map shows um, the original settlement at what's now Harvard Square. Uh, Boston on its peninsula, surrounded by water on all sides, connected to the mainland only by a narrow street, uh, that uh, Washington Street, that would flood at high tides. Um, and uh, Kendall Square, you'll see represented by this purple star uh, throughout the presentation to give you some orientation. Uh, Kendall Square was for um, that 100 years, 150 years at least, was not a place where any would, anyone would go or even could go, um, and certainly not at high tide because most of it would have been underwater. So in this period and, and until 1793, there are only two ways to get to Boston, um, none of them direct. Um, the road uh, to Boston crossed by the Harvard Stadium, went down through Brookline Village, Dudley Square, and up Washington Street, eight miles. Um, by road, or you could go four miles out to uh, what's today Sullivan Square, down into Charlestown, and take a ferry into Boston um, and uh, pay for the privilege, of, of course. So Cambridge was isolated. The college liked it that way, kept the undergraduates out of trouble. Um, and Cambridge remained a, a very small uh, village uh, for the first couple of hundred years of its settlement. This is the first view of Cambridge made by a French um, um, intelligence agent who came down from Quebec in the 1660s uh, produced this map 20 years later that shows the meeting house and uh, the college. Um, this is, these are two Harvard buildings, this one and this one, and then the village around it and called it a, a, a town of 80 houses and one university. Um, didn't, 80 house, would that be First Church Cambridge? Uh, this would be 80 houses um, in... 
The Meeting House, yes. Was First Church Cambridge? Uh, yes, First Parish. First Parish. First Parish. Um, and there's a whole um, ecclesiastical history about the difference between the First Parish and the First Church. It's not a not a happy story. But this this is the this is the First Church of the First Parish, or the First Meeting House of the First Parish. So by the Revolution. Um, yeah, this is, uh, what, 135 years after settlement. Uh, the, the village at Harvard Square was really still very small um, and grouped around the university, or the Harvard Yard, as it became. This is Massachusetts Hall. Um, that's the fourth meeting house on the corner where um, Lehman Hall is today. The, the kiosk is right there in that triangle. Uh, this is the old burying ground at the corner of Garden Street. There's the bridge over the Charles, uh, the stadium's over here. Uh, this is, a, you can, perhaps you can make this out. This is a hill uh, surrounded, or not surrounded, but bordered by salt marshes along the river. Uh, the curve of Brattle Street and Elliott Street uh, is um, described by a creek that rose in Harvard Yard, rose, went through Harvard Square around the foot of the hill and out here by um, um, Elliott House. Um, so the village is nestled on top of this hill. Winthrop Square, the little open space on Kennedy Street, was the town marketplace and has uh, always been a, a public space. So the, the landscape at the time of the Revolution was characterized um, was an agricultural landscape, but it was a lot of it was occupied by estates, um, by the the loyalist families who had settled plantations in the West Indies uh, and in Barbados, Jamaica, Antigua, and the rest, and found the climate um, unsupportable uh, for raising families. And began to uh, establish second homes in um, in Rhode Island um, and on the Mystic River in Massachusetts and on the Charles River around the 1750s. And so by 1775, uh, a good proportion of the town um, of what's today Cambridge was occupied by these estates. Uh, these were wealthy families who were politically loyal to the, to the English government. Uh, they were slave owners. Uh, many of them had plantation, sugar plantations in the West Indies, uh, brought their slaves from there. Um, these were all sort of gentlemen's plantations. They weren't really agricultural enterprises. Um, but they did occupy uh, a large uh, amount of territory. Um, there's Kendall Square off on the edge of town. Um, the um, brown divisions are lot lines. These are property divisions and the characteristic of this area, these long, long narrow lots uh, represented the only thing of value that was generated in this area was salt marsh hay which was uh, extremely valuable for agricultural use. Um, uh, you could mulch with it, the seeds wouldn't germinate in fresh water. Um, cows could bed in it, you know, cows would eat it. Um, it, it was extremely valuable, the most valuable agricultural product in Cambridge. So uh, these lots were constantly being subdivided among heirs and you might have a lot eight or 10 feet wide running for uh, several hundred feet into the marshes down to, um, down to, the, to the mud flats. Um, otherwise, Kendall Square was basically worthless. And so uh, the Loyalist estates uh, were all um, had houses, of which this was the grandest on Brattle Street. This is now the Longfellow National Historic Site. Uh, George Washington had slept here uh, during the um, early days of the Revolution. And the uh, common people lived in the village in houses like this um, on uh, Kennedy Street at the corner of South Street. The landscape um, at the time of the Revolution is really um, is almost completely open. Uh, the, um, uh, most of the natural forest cover had long since disappeared, been cut over. Uh, the agriculture here was mostly uh, grazing and pasturing. Uh, the soil wasn't, soil wasn't very productive, so there weren't many crops that were raised, although it was good soil for fruit trees. So this is a view looking um, from over West Cambridge. This is Brattle Street running down into the village. Uh, this is Spark Street. Um, and the, this is the Charles River and the, the Great Bridge, um, the, what's now the Anderson Bridge by the Harvard Stadium. 
uh, Dana Hill in the background on the horizon beyond the village. So the Charles River is tidal um, until 1909. It's the easiest way to get around, uh, but of course it, um, it floods. The banks are shallow. This is, uh, this view, these views, by the way, are of a model that we made at the time of the bicentennial that were based on the best available research at the time. So we still think they're pretty reliable. Um, the tide, it's about a half tide. And so you can make out the channel of the river and you can make out the mud flats. This is where the business school is today, Harvard Business School. And then these are salt marshes. This is the edge of um, a salt marsh. So at spring tides, about once a month, all of this area would flood um, right up to about that, that line. Uh, so this is a neighborhood called the, uh, the Marsh, still called the Marsh in Cambridge. It was settled in the 1850s. Um, by Irish immigrants. Uh, Kerry Corner down here, where beyond the Harvard houses, was the lower marsh. And uh, these, the marshes covered uh, large parts of, of, the, of the, the town. So um, the person who took advantage of all of this open space around the village was Francis Dana, who was uh, the first, America's first ambassador to St. Petersburg, uh, came back and became the Chief Justice of Massachusetts. Um, he lived in a house on Dana Hill um, over here. Uh, this is a view taken from about the site of Widener Library, uh, looking uh, east on, this is Harvard Street, uh, Massachusetts Avenue is going off there. The, the um, inn at Harvard would be about here. Francis Dana uh, lived, uh, or was a patriot, uh, lived on the scale of the, the loyalists who lost their estates after the revolution. Um, in, this, um, in this house, which was right about there on Massachusetts Avenue where Dana Street comes in. There's a bluff that falls off. If you're going towards Harvard Square, falls off on your, on your left. There are views um, all around. Um, and at that time, in that open landscape, Dana um, could see across Boston, could see ships coming into Boston Harbor. Um, and uh, had a, a, an open view of all of this landscape east of the village, which by the time of the revolution um, had only three farms. Um, there was one at Leachmere's Point in East Cambridge. There was another one up here and another one uh, right about behind City Hall, Dana's house dated uh, a couple of years after the revolution. So Kendall Square, you can see in this fairly detailed chart, um, is really at the edge of nowhere. There's the channel of the Charles River at low tide with soundings um, would bring you up. You could navigate about as far as Boston Common or the Public Garden, um, but you needed at least a half tide or a full tide to get up to um, uh, past Harvard Square, which uh, was often done. Um, these were the, the, um, the flats and these were the salt marshes that made East Cambridge an island at high tides. So a lot of this, um, a lot of what's now dry ground in Cambridge is um, uh, originated as tidelands. So uh, what Dana did was to uh, get investors together to build the first bridge direct to Boston. This is the West Boston Bridge of 1793 on the line of the Longfellow Bridge where the, the subway crosses. That's the State House on Beacon Hill. Uh, we're looking from Cambridge, from Kendall Square, into Boston. So very quickly, um, within about 35 years, uh, what had had a territory that had only three farms suddenly has two new villages. This is a map of 1830. So all of these streets, all of these buildings um, in this area east of, of Harvard Square have all developed in, in 35 years' time. The, um, what the West Boston Bridge did was to open up a desire line uh, that extended up into uh, the middle of Vermont. Uh, so middle and southern Vermont, uh, western Massachusetts, southern New Hampshire, all of that agricultural produce um, um, wanted to reach the Boston market and all of it had formerly had to be transported through Charlestown or a long way around that I showed you. And now all of a sudden uh, they could save five miles of travel on dirt roads by um, by accessing the West Boston Bridge through Kendall Square. So 
Um, the bridge was actually about three quarters of a mile across and three quarters of a mile of causeway across the mudflats down to Lafayette Square. And, um, and then promoted the construction of River Street and Western Avenue and those bridges of um, Massachusetts Avenue up to the village of Harvard Street of Broadway was actually an extension of the Concord Turnpike. So Concord Avenue and Broadway and Cambridge um, uh, were built as a toll road uh, going out to, uh, to Concord. Hampshire Street was the Middlesex Turnpike. It was named Hampshire Street because it led to New Hampshire. Uh, to Tewksbury on the Merrimack River where it connected with one of the New Hampshire turnpikes. And then in 1809, a second bridge was built across from East Cambridge and that led to another, uh, to a, a grid plan settlement at East Cambridge and another street, Cambridge Street, and other improvements. And these, these real estate people and bridge proprietors were constantly competing to shortcut each other's routes to open up land for development to um, um, to attract um, activity, and um, it was a period of enormous turmoil. It's just a, an insane free-for-all for real estate developers, because after 35 years, you have a village at Cambridgeport, which is settled uh, primarily by uh, migrants from northern New England, from the Maritimes, um, who are dealing with highway traffic. Uh, they're running taverns and scales and workshops uh, for the, serving the traffic into Kendall Square, into Boston. East Cambridge is founded as a, an industrial suburb around the glass works. So Lafayette Square, which is the intersection of Main Street and Mass Avenue, uh, had the first meeting house in Cambridgeport. Um, that's where the, some of you may remember the Shell station that used to be there, and then it's now, part of a park that's Main Street going off here, Massachusetts Avenue coming from Harvard Square there. Uh, these were taverns and warehouses and stores uh, serving people on the, on the highways to Boston. East Cambridge is industrial. Uh, the New England Glass Works uh, was founded there in the early days of the century. Uh, um, workers were imported from Germany and Scotland uh, to work in the glass factories, and the town grew up around them and the Middlesex County. Courthouse, Whereas the old village, by this time, was becoming known as Harvard, as, as Old Cambridge, um, is as simple, a, a quiet, more or less you know, settled place that's been there for uh, two centuries already. Um, so it has a sense of its heritage. Uh, it has Harvard, the world's soon to become, and even then, the world's greatest university, right? And so Old Cambridge had an attitude toward it that uh, uh, caused resentment in East Cambridge and Cambridgeport where people were new, uh, where they had to go to town meeting and ask for funds for schools and roads and services that the old Cambridge taxpayers were not uh, eager to give. So um, in the 1840s, uh, folks in old Cambridge uh, attempted to secede and set themselves off as a separate town and divide this town at, at Lee Street and cut loose Cambridgeport and East Cambridge, and then Old Cambridge then would become a separate, a separate town with North Cambridge as kind of a, a suburb. So by this time, uh, this is another um, 25 years after the 1830 map, um, you can see that the grid plan in East Cambridge is filling out, the streets in Cambridgeport are filling out um, uh, pretty satisfactorily. Not much is happening at uh, Kendall Square, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So um, the town um, in the 1850s began to see itself as a potential suburb of Boston. Uh, Boston was becoming overcrowded. The Irish were settling in the North End, driving out the Yankees who were looking for new places to live. Uh, Cambridge was an obvious prospect. The tolls on the bridges disappeared in 1854. Um, two men had this vision uh, Gardner Green Hubbard um, and Estes Howe. Howe was a medical doctor uh, who gave it up and became a real estate investor. Gardner Hubbard was a, an attorney who's um, best known because his daughter uh, married Alexander Graham Bell. She was deaf. He was her teacher. Um, Hubbard was the lawyer who set up the Bell, the original Bell telephone companies and had the idea of um, you used to have to rent your telephone equipment from AT&T uh, pay a monthly rent for that handset um, with the dial up, uh, with the dial, uh, which was the brilliant idea that Gillette used to sell you razors and razor blades, um, and made AT&T the powerhouse that it was. So Hubbard 
uh, started out in real estate and uh, to, to serve his real estate ventures, he established a whole series of important urban infrastructure ventures. The first one was the Harvard Branch Railroad uh, that came down from the Fitchburg Division in Somerville, had a station at uh, where the Harvard Law School um, is on uh, facing Cambridge Common. It only lasted five years. Um, it couldn't attract enough passengers. It was the first railroad abandoned in Massachusetts. Um, in 1852, he and Howe uh, established the Cambridge Gas Company. Uh, uh, gas was produced at that time by um, heating coal in a, in a retort, uh, driving off the gas, and then uh, that leaves you with coke as a byproduct. But the coal would be captured in uh, a gas holder. This is a conical structure with a, a roof that barely shows up here, but the, uh, that encloses a steel tank, which is like an upside down cup and a water seal. Gas is produced by, by heating coal. Um, it um, is pumped into that, into that um, uh, container, the weight of which provides the pressure to drive the gas out into the mains under the streets and to people's homes, where it was mostly used for illuminating and for street lights um, in this early period. This is at the foot of Ash Street, where the Memorial Drive apartments are now. So they also founded the Cambridge Water Works as a private business in 1852 to take water from a uh, fresh pond. Um, they built a reservoir on Reservoir Hill with a standpipe for additional pressure, uh, laid pipes under the streets, um, uh, and um, the city actually took this over in 1865, and it's now the current water department. And then they founded the Cambridge Railroad, which was the first horse railroad, the first street railroad, um, the second in the U.S. after one in New Orleans uh, to run from Bowdoin Square in Boston, uh, Government Center, um, out Main Street and Mass Avenue to um, Harvard Square and out beyond that to Mount Auburn, uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery, which was, sounds strange, but Mount Auburn was like the amusement park at the end of the streetcar line. Um, it was a place where people in Boston in thousands uh, would go on um, weekend, uh, weekends to enjoy the, the landscape. And so by the 1860s, uh, Harvard Square is becoming a, um, a real center for, uh, for the western part of Cambridge, but also for the western suburbs. All the streetcar lines uh, that came in from Watertown, from Newton, from Waltham, from Arlington, all funneled into Harvard Square where people would change to take the streetcar uh, into Boston. So it became a transfer point and get a, got an economic importance that it had never had in the first 200 years of its existence. Um, Harvard Square is also characterized by a lot of buildings and services that were intended to, um, to support students at the university. Um, these buildings are, um, one of them was built by the university as a, as a dormitory for graduate students. These were early private dormitories. Uh, Harvard uh, never intended and did not provide accommodations for all of its students. Um, by the end of the 19th century, only seniors were guaranteed dormitory rooms and they lived in the yard. Um, everybody else, including 14-year-old freshmen, would have to find accommodations in the town, uh, either at boarding houses or for the people who were, had well-to-do parents in private dormitories that were built expressly for this purpose. Um, uh, where uh, students would get together and live in essentially apartments without cooking uh, um, facilities. Um, the, um, uh, everybody ate in the town, in restaurants and lunchrooms in the village in Harvard Square. Um, Harvard uh, came late to providing dining hall services and, um, and that was, a, that was much, a much later development. And in fact, Harvard Undergraduates didn't have to live in Harvard dorms, and Harvard could not provide Harvard accommodations until uh, about 1929, uh, when the river houses were, were finally opened. So um, the rest of Cambridge, of old Cambridge at this point, was becoming a suburb. This is Mass Avenue looking north towards Porter Square. This, uh, in this period, was the month, one of the most prestigious residential streets in the Boston area. All of these large mansions going up and down the street and on both sides. Uh, there was no commercial activity here until about World War I. Uh, at the end of Mass Avenue uh, is Porter Square. This is, um, this is what suburban Cambridge um, 
uh, this best represents suburban Cambridge. There's the railroad station where the subway uh, headhouse is now on Harvard Square. There's a, a train in the cut. There's a horse car on Massachusetts Avenue at the corner of Upland Road. Uh, these churches um, actually existed, and so did this little house, um, which now uh, faces Porter Square, faces the Porter Square bookstore. Um, this would, uh, engraving, this lithograph was done as a real estate promotion for the property associated with this house, which was known as the Pine Island Cottage. There's the pine tree, there's the <laughs> island. We thought this, uh, when we first saw this, we thought this is just a cartoon, this is a joke. But in fact, uh, the, this little pond and this little island show up on a map, and um, there it is. So this is, this is how Cambridge was developing in uh, the 19th century as a middle-class uh, suburb of Boston. So um, now we're going to go to Kendall Square. Uh, this is Kendall Square, or the, the Cambridgeport shoreline in 1847. The, um, the bridge is the West Boston Bridge. Uh, that's the bridgehead. Um, about where, um, well, now the dry land is about here, um, and the streets intersecting here. So this area initially had a burst of activity after the bridge was built. A group of entrepreneurs had the vision that uh, if they dug canals through the marshes that they could attract um, traffic coming out of the Middlesex Canal. The Middlesex Canal came out in the Charles um, up around uh, Sullivan Square, Canal boats um, were, could cross the Charles into the north end of Boston, and they thought, well, why not uh, have canal boats come up here into Kendall Square where they can unload their traffic uh, cargoes of granite and wood and lumber and firewood and uh, transship them to coastal schooners for, for trade elsewhere. So um, uh, folks built um, uh, the Broad Canal which exists now to about here, but once went all the way back to um, uh, Portland Street and up behind um, all the way through North Cam uh, East Cambridge. There's a cross canal, there's a dock. This is Broadway. Um, this is Harvard Street, which once connected to Maine. Um, and a, a, a dock and a south canal, a cross canal, and we are right about there. Um, this is Dock Street. Uh, that was the dock. A, dock. a stub of Dock Street exists next to the fire station, the firehouse hotel across the street. It was called Dock Street for obvious reasons. So when you came across the river from Boston in the 1850s, um, this is the, um, the replacement for the original uh, West Boston Bridge, but it's on the same location with a drawbridge in the middle. Um, that's Kendall Square in the background. If that factory right there is this one, if you came across at low tide, uh, you had the kind of noxious experience of a mud flat at low tide where all the sewage of all the, um, of Kendall Square and of all the surrounding towns uh, was pumped directly into the Charles River, uh, became an enormous public health hazard. As the tide went out, the sewage collects on the mud flats, uh, dries out in the sun. It's blown around in the clouds of dust um, in the westerly winds and um, was a major impediment to people living anywhere near the Charles River um, until an interceptor sewer was built in the 1890s. So moving on into Kendall Square, uh, that's Broadway and Main Street. Um, Boston's behind us. And um, the, um, the hotel is over here, and your office building, this building, is in the middle of this block somewhere back here. So by this time, uh, from the, say, the 1840s on, this is a, actually a residential neighborhood. There was an elementary school down here, uh, a collection of houses. People lived here, um, worked in the factories nearby, or commuted into Boston. The Broad Canal like everything on the Charles, uh, emptied out at low tide. It was served by coastal schooners. Um, this slide's not very clear, but that's the stern of a two-masted schooner that's tied up at a, at a wharf here. Um, uh, the two-masted schooners were the semi-trailers of the 19th century. Uh, they carried any kind of bulk cargo anywhere you could get. Um, you had more than maybe six feet of water at high tide. 
Uh, they had to be flat bottomed because they would, uh, as the tide went out, they'd rest on the mud. Um, but they were uh, capacious and cheap and um, functioned um, in um, coastal commerce until the 1920s um, in, um, in New England. Um, so the Broad Canal runs running almost a mile um, up into, um, into Cambridgeport. The industries here at this time in the late 19th century were uh, smokestack industries. George Blake um, started out uh, developing steam-powered pumps for uh, emptying out clay pits. And um, in World War I, uh, the company, it was said that every naval ship that was launched had uh, between three and 400 pumps from Blake uh, performing different functions on, on the ship. This became a, a national supplier of, of, um, of steam pumps and machinery. Part of, that, part of that complex, this part right here, the former brass foundry, uh, is still exists on the corner of Binney and Third Street. Just down Binney Street, Alden Spear was a chemical company. Uh, these brick buildings, this brick building was owned by Standard Oil, was a warehouse, had a railroad siding behind it. Uh, those brick buildings are now um, part of Biogen, have been adapted or were used as part of the Biogen complex. Up further up Binney is Boston Woven Hose and Rubber. Uh, rubber was a major industry in this area. There were at least two rubber factories, uh, American Rubber on the east side of Binney Street, and then Boston Woven Hose uh, was a major national supplier of hoses. Um, this complex still exists. The Kendall Square Cinema is right back there where the um, Boston and Albany Freight House used to be. Um, all of these buildings, almost all of these buildings still exist except for this one and this one. So, um, and if you look around, at least on the perimeter of Kendall Square, you can see these layers of history that part of which I have to say we managed to protect on purpose because we want to, uh, we want to uh, preserve these, these memories of when Cambridge was a place where people made things, where it was a smokestack town uh, that was in the early 20th century being compared to Detroit as an emerging industrial powerhouse. I and mean, you can think of where Detroit went and where we've gone. Uh, I think we got the better part of the bargain. Um, so by 1910, the, the Longfellow Bridge has com been completed here. The subway's not in place yet, but that's Kendall Square. Well, Kendall Square is actually there, but this is the industrial area around it. Um, East Cambridge is off, off up here. Uh, this building still exists. That's the uh, Athenaeum Press Building has the statue of Athena that you can see from the red line as you cross. Um, uh, Athenaeum Press was a uh, textbook publisher uh, for the most part. But uh, they too were, had their smokestack aspects. They received their paper and fuel and um, presumably shipped out their school books by, by rail. Uh, all of this area uh, north of the Broad Canal was laced with uh, railroad sidings that served the various industries until the 1960s. Then um, on the other side of Main Street, where the, the Charles River used to come right up to Main Street uh, and where MIT is today, uh, all of that had to be filled and, um, and enclosed and the tides kept out. So this is looking from the Longfellow Bridge down to the Harvard Bridge where Massachusetts Avenue is crossing. MIT is down somewhere in the far distance. Uh, these are schooners that are bringing blocks of granite from Cape Ann um, and laying them on the mud, actually on pilings driven into the mud. So this is the seawall, the current seawall that comes from the Longfellow Bridge, curves around and goes down past MIT and past the bridge, almost to the BU Bridge. Uh, then uh, Steam-powered dredges sucked sand out of the remaining basin of the Charles River across the seawall to fill in all of this area to make dry ground. So that, that process worked like this. Um, this is, um, well, this is 1889. There's been a little bit of filling down here. The original shoreline is back almost to Brookline Street down here towards the BU Bridge. But by Mass Avenue, not much has been filled. There's a natural point here. The Harvard Bridge on Mass Ave has been built, uh, is being built at this time, and all of this area is uh, mudflat. Kendall Square is up at the top. 
And the next photograph is taken from this perspective going across open water. Um, so we're standing on this bulkhead. That's Main Street. This is the Firehouse Hotel. Um, there's the city's coal wharf. Uh, that's where the city got its fuel for schools and municipal buildings. And your building is right in the middle of that complex of factories and three-deckers on the other side of Main Street. So this area where you used to be able to, you know, Google would probably do this for you now. I mean, give you a landing with a boat that you could take out at lunchtime, um, except, you know, it's a little bit further of a walk than it used to be. So this is probably tides part way down. High tide, you know, it's a nine foot tidal range here, so high tide is just below, you can see that mark, uh, just below the edge of the bulkhead. Um, but um, you could sail for a good few hours a day. So once the seawall was built, um, Longfellow Bridge is at the bottom, there's Memorial Drive, MIT in the background, you're about there, uh, the firehouse is here, uh, creates a, a whole swath of, of new land. Uh, buildings like the 238 Main with a clock tower that's designed not so you can tell time around here, but so people in Boston will see it on the horizon and say, oh, that's where Kendall Square is, uh, let's, put, let's put our factory over there. But by the 1950s, um, this is um, an area where the industry is in decline. Um, after World War II, uh, a lot of uh, firms closed up or moved south, and um, areas, a lot, of it, a lot of Kendall Square, broadly Kendall Square, um, became parking lots for people take, driving in, taking the subway into Boston. So there's the clock tower. Uh, your building's off to the left. Uh, this is Third Street coming down. Um, this is the only building in the picture that's still standing. Um, all of these other buildings were taken down in the urban renewal period. This is the modern version of the gas holder that I showed you that from 1870s that was up on Ash Street um, because coal, um, uh, the gas works moved down here. Uh, coal was brought into the Broad Canal, heated and, and so on. Also a lot of oil um, was brought in uh, trans on barges transshipped in the Broad Canal. Um, so that, there's the clock tower building. Uh, the earlier view is looking across here at these gas holders. Here's the Broad Canal, which currently stops right about here uh, as it originally extended up into the neighborhood. Uh, you guys are about here. And uh, fuel oil deliveries, deliveries after, after the Texas pipelines reached the New England in about 1952. Uh, they stopped um, making coal gas. That's why we talk about natural gas because natural gas is coming by pipeline from Texas. Uh, what they had previously was coal gas, so, but they all called it gas. And then natural gas came in um, as a distinct, uh, distinctly different product. Uh, the fuel oil deliveries lasted until about the mid-1980s, and since then the Broad Canal hasn't had any industrial use. Um, other landmarks were the demise of Lever Brothers. The soap, soap manufacturers had their major U.S. factory and headquarters here on Broadway, um, between Broadway and, um, and Main Street. That was taken down in 1958, replaced by Tech Square. Uh, the, first, uh, the first chapter in the modern history of Kendall Square is the construction of Tech Square by MIT and a private real estate developer. Um, then um, NASA uh, came along. Um, NASA uh, uh, developed, was developing its space program in the 1960s. Uh, they um, uh, were going to build a space center in Houston where it is, is today. They wanted an electronics research center uh, that would be close to MIT. They were looking for 3,200 acres um, uh, close to MIT and they settled for uh, 14 acres um, in Kendall Square. That was um, industrial land that was going to be cleared for, um, for this purpose. So this is looking from, there's Boston Woven Hose, uh, this is um, Hampshire Street and, and Broadway. That's the end of the very end of the Broad Canal going off towards the Charles River. So this area uh, was all designated as an urban and rural area. There were 3,000 people working here. So it was a major gamble by the city to um, clear out those 3,000 jobs on the, on the hope that um, 
20th century jobs would replace them. The initial design for the NASA center was going to be like this with three towers uh, for this electronics research center and um, a commercial development on, along Main Street. Uh, what happened was that about half of one tower was built. That's the building that's over here now at Volpe. And, um, and part of this building was built and the rest of it uh, was never built. So this is, this is what the city came up with to replace all of those parking lots, a uh, development where you're now a part of. And uh, Kendall Square then continued. And for the old guys in the room, there's the F&T uh, yeah. delicatessen and the F&T diner while the subway is being, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I knew that it gets you. <laughs> the subway station's being extended. Um, so these buildings are now being preserved. So I gotta finish up with, quickly with Harvard Square. So Harvard Square um, joins the 20th century in, in, in the 20th century and be, gets a subway station, gets buildings that are familiar today. In the 1970s, um, it becomes a different kind of a capital. Um, um, uh, some of you recognize that and now you can see this view recalls the model view. There's Massachusetts Avenue. That's where the meeting house was and the cemetery down here. So what have I not talked about? This is a seven pound, 13 ounce book. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more. There's neighborhood history. Uh, there's Harvard University. There's printing and publishing. This is from the Library of Congress. That's the Riverside Press seal and the ceiling of one of their buildings. Uh, residential architecture, you get Susan to come back and talk about that, about business and commercial architecture, about river transportation, the schooners that uh, went up uh, to wharves in Harvard Square and even into Watertown uh, until 1900. Mass transportation, the subway and streetcar yards that dominated Harvard, parts of Harvard Square until the 1960s. And social history, not least, uh, Longfellow, um, Longfellow and his, and his wife, she's holding Charlie Longfellow by his neck so that he, um, you know, it's because you couldn't move. <laughs> Charlie was squirmy. Um, George Washington Lewis and his wife, um, Penelope, uh, uh, Penelope uh, Farwell, the goodies who are cleaning ladies at Harvard in the 19th century and the African American waiters at Memorial Hall. So all of these folks are represented in the book and that's my last word. Sorry. Thank you, Charlie. Come on, did I answer every single question you might have? <laughs> I know I'm comprehensive. Okay. Yes. So, um, so some, some number of years ago, oh, some number of years ago, while I was between jobs, I uh, went to, I was hanging out at the Registry of Deeds doing, um, doing basically a title search on my property just to figure out what, what its history was. That means and you're, I got, you're hardcore. If you're and I got that, back right. as far as like the mid to late 1800s uh, where I learned that it was part of the almshouse lands and I wasn't able to get any further back than that. And I was wondering if you had any comments about the almshouse and what was there before. Well, there were three different arms, arms houses. This uh, was the one so this would have been on Prospect Street. On Prospect, Prospect Street? Prospect yeah. Street. Uh, 66. Okay, well, uh, here's my card. <laughs> there, there was an almshouse land, I think, between Austin Street and Harvard Street, or maybe you went a little. Okay, past. that's that's a new one. Here's my card. <laughs> Give us a call. Oh, okay. We'll talk. Yes. So uh, it's kind of interesting how Cambridge sort of went from, from vast expanses of farmland slash nothing into, you know, house upon house upon house. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how sort of the ownership worked for these, you know, marshes and even the river parts that got filled in. You know, was there someone who was just was extraordinarily lucky who owned all that land and got to sell it off, or how, how did the owner, how does the ownership work when they create land like that? Well, if you remember the slide that um, uh, had all the loyalist estates on it, um, that one uh, showed you areas where real estate development was relatively uh, measured and carefully organized, so that um, 
that was represented capital to those to those landowners, and they would carefully lay out streets and sell off lots and try to do it in sequence. Um, other areas were um, were farms that were divided up and pretty much sold off at random. There's this whole process. There's no there's no central planning of streets in Cambridge until the 20th century. Um, so the streets would be laid out by the, by the property developers. Uh, they would try to work with each other. Uh, typically, they'd sell lots, as two or three lots at a time at most, to a carpenter who would build houses on spec, live in one until he sold it, and then buy another two or three lots. So it's a pretty disorganized, uh, organic process. It's not centrally located, uh, centrally planned. Nothing like, you know, Levittown comes to mind, but you know, nothing like organized suburban development except um, 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 Coolidge Hill and um, Larchwood in West Cambridge in the 20th century were small planned suburbs. Everything else is kind of random. How early would you say was all of the land privately owned in some respects? Well, you know, privately owned as opposed to... As opposed to, you know, land no one has settled on yet, right? Was that oh, well, early back all, in the 1600s, the was, basically? was granted out. Um, uh, some of it was owned in common. It was initially, well, let's say in 1630, it was all owned in common um, by the Massachusetts Bay Company. So it was divided into towns. Uh, towns would organize... Um, as, as parishes, actually, and as proprietors. That the, in Cambridge, there were the proprietors of common lands, group of citizens that were authorized to divide public land uh, and give it out to existing property owners. So that was, that was complete by 1750. There wasn't any, after that, there was almost no more public land left. So every scrap was privately owned. So, for example, the mud flats that became MIT, who were they owned by before they were drained? Well, the, the flats um, you, in Massachusetts, you can own um, tide lands out to the low tide line. And so um, they didn't have much value, but you could get title to them. And um, uh, an individual did, a guy named Charles Davenport, at a factory on, further down on Main Street. Uh, thought he saw a lot of potential in the Tidelands, and um, he's the one that organized a company to build the seawall and fill in those flats. But he was buying them for pennies in the 1860s and 70s and assembling all of that Tideland so that then he could do a major development. Where MIT is, it was supposed to be a neighborhood that would mirror Boston's Back Bay. That's a whole other talk, but um, you know, Back Bay, same thing, seawall, filled in behind the seawall, uh, straight streets laid out, lots sold on a regular basis, on a uh, consistent planned basis. Um, they're trying to do the same thing in Cambridge, but didn't work, and the MIT came along and scooped it up. Thank goodness. And yeah. south of East Cambridge, it was bought up by a development company, and they planned it all out, so it was a bigger area, and you got more regular streets, but then they sold it off. Well, let's thank our speakers again. Thank you. Thanks so much.